give them two more minutes. I see that our speaker is in the house, Mrs. Davis Delancey. So happy to have you with us. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity. Call that friend, that neighbor who would ordinarily be taking up this one hour of your time. Call them and tell them to get in here. We're about to begin. And while we are waiting for those other persons to come, please feel free. The chat has been enabled, so you can drop a note in the chat. If you're an alum of BTVI, please, by all means, let me know who you are. Let me know what year you graduated so that we can send a shout out to you. Okay, I think the two minutes is up. So Ms. Key, if you can please begin the recording. Good evening, it's recording. Thank you. So good evening all, good evening all. It is a pleasure to see all of you. My, how time flies. It doesn't feel as if it was one whole month since we last met, but guess what? It was. And so I thank you all for coming out this evening as I look around the Zoom room. I see some other familiar faces. And of course, we're always, always so happy to see our chairman in. So thank you so much, Mr. Basin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to um, allow you to... All right, Beth Sands graduated in 2019 with a degree in Office Administration. Yes, Beth, yes, 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 yes. So... Mr. Basin is with us, our chairman, always, always very supportive. And now, Mr. Basin, you're able to unmute, so you feel free, you can say a few words to us. Okay, yes, uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome all of those who have uh, already logged in, uh, in particular, our uh, guest speaker for the night. I'm always happy when we have these type initiative. As one who attended BTBI back in the day when it was called CR Walker Technical College, I know the quality of the education and all that it can do. Uh, BTBI over the years has prepared so many persons, uh, not only for careers, but also uh, entrepreneurship. And so we want to encourage that. I also want to say, uh, to those on the line as well, as you all are aware, learning is lifelong. And so even though you may be an alumni, uh, there's still many courses at BTBI that you can uh, take advantage of. I myself uh, enrolled in one early this year. Uh, it's always about, you know, staying current, being alive, uh, continuing to, uh, to learn. So having said that, I want to encourage all of you to participate uh, continue to spread the word to your fellow colleagues about this uh, alumni series. It's an opportunity for um, alumni to be able to get together. Uh, and even at this point in time, there's still the opportunity for networking. You may be surprised at the contacts that you can establish um, just through this uh, alumni series. I want to encourage all of you. So having said that, thank you. I wish you another successful alumni series. Thank you very much. Thank you. We also see AVP Veronica Colley in the room. Thank you so much. Veronica Colley is the AVP of the Freeport campus. So we're always, always so happy. And of course, I see that our academic dean, Dr. Pichette Murphy, is also signing in at this time. So we're all, you're all among family. You're all among friends. And just a quick reminder, the chat has been enabled. So we encourage you, there's gonna be a lot of exciting stuff discussed this evening. So we encourage you to send your questions, to send your comments. And of course, Mrs. Davis Delancey will have an opportunity to respond to them. I would now like to also remind you, you know, it's always good to sit with your back facing a wall, just in case, just in case. And so that's one of the best 
practices that we always encourage when you're in a Zoom meeting. So we will now, without further delay, I invite my colleague, Mrs. Laurie Tucker, with the official welcome. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson, and good evening, all. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the second presentation in the Bahamas Technical and Vocational Institute's Distinguished Alumni Speaker Series. As you are probably already aware, these sessions are hosted monthly and attendees care from our brightest and best alumni who share their journeys with us. The series is intended to serve many purposes, including the recognition of outstanding alumni for their accomplishments and leadership in their field, raising visibilities of the Bahamas Technical and Vocational Institute to both internal and external audience educating existing students about career possibilities associated with their chosen field of study and learning how we may continuously improve on the various programs offered at the Institute. Thank you so much for joining us. And I encourage you to call a friend and ask them to sign on. You are in for a treat. Listen carefully and ask as many questions as you wish. And as we welcome the speaker, we would learn how the ride on the wrong bus, take her to the right destination. Thank you very much, Laurie. And so I'm sure that you're all feeling extremely welcome. If you didn't feel welcome before now, we know that you're feeling extremely welcome. And so now the purpose for us being here, I'm sure that you are as excited as I am to hear this story about how that ride on that bus um, got Mrs. Davis Delancey to where she is today. So without further ado, our guest speaker for this evening, of course, is a distinguished alumna of the BTVI. She is the retired deputy commissioner of police. She is currently serving as the national coordinator of the National Neighborhood Watch Program at the Ministry of National Security. She had a distinguished career of 38 years on the Royal Bahamas Police Force. She is married to Mr. Keith Delancey. She is the mother of one son, Mr. Rashad Davis. Now I know that most of you, if not all, and I, I dare to say all of you were just as proud as I was when we saw Mrs. Davis Delancey QPM. And we're gonna to get to that QPM a little later. But when we saw her ascend to the level on the Royal Bahamas Police Force, which she did, it happened during a time when most of us were under lockdown, right? During one of the waves of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so she had a captive audience. And I can tell you, I was excited I was very excited to see that she had attained that level. But I was in half, I was 10 times more excited if I were to say, when Dr. Robertson came to my office one day, the president of BTVI, and he said, you know, that police chief lady, she is one of our alum. And right away, I knew which police chief lady he meant. And he said, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea if we were to get her in here. And I said, say no more. Now I'm never one to be shy, but I just didn't know how to approach Ms. Davis Delancey. Um, but you know, I made a few calls and I got a number. And one thing I can say about her, she is extremely humble. When I called, it was a cold call, but she listened. She didn't say to me, well, you know, you should have gone through my assistant. She listened. And then I could hear her, I could see her smiling through the phone and she said, okay, just let me know and I will put you in my calendar. And so that is how our conversation started and Mrs. Davis Delancey, I'm so pleased that you agreed to come and to present. And so without further ado, please, um, you may begin. Okay, unmute please. Good evening, and thank you very much, um, Ms. Thompson, for your kind remarks. I'd like to extend thanks to Mr. Basin, um, Ms. Tucker, and for all of those who are on the Zoom this afternoon. I'm indeed privileged 
to be here this afternoon um, because it was the wrong bus that took me here. And so let me start with my story. I went to Arab Bailey in 1979 and took the police exam the first year that I got to Arab Bailey. Even though I was in grade 10 and had no prospects of graduation until 1981, I wanted to be a police officer or a mechanic. And so having graduated in 1981, I went to BTVI to register to be a mechanic. The class was full. And so I decided to do hotel training. And I did my hotel training classes. It was then called ITC. Um, Mr. Baston referred to as CR Walker, but at that time it was ITC. And there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Blyden. He was the teacher who taught us um, at that time. And so I completed my training there and we had to do the on-job training. And I was posted at Balmoral Hotel, which was in Cable Beach. And so every morning for the next six weeks, I would catch the bus and go to Balmoral. We lived on East Street. And so I would catch the bus to Bay Street and then from Bay Street to Cable Beach. And so one day I finished my, my training and decided to catch the bus to come home. Lo and behold, I caught the wrong bus. The bus driver took me in the Oaksfield area. And so when we got in the area of Sun Pen Motors, he said, this is as far as I'm going. I said, but I don't live this way. He said, well, this is as far as I'm going. You need to come off the bus. And so I came off the bus, disgusted, frustrated, started crying um, because for many of us who are on the platform, you know, we grew up in strict homes and I had a certain time to be home. And I'm thinking now, how am I going to explain to my mom that I caught the wrong bus and to get home late? Because even though I had finished school, even though I was working, I had chores. And so I'm just, my mind is going a thousand miles a minute trying to figure what am I going to do? And as I'm walking, I walked in the area of the police college and then I stopped. I said, I can't take this no more. And I stopped and went into the police college to inquire about a recruitment class. And at that time they were doing a recruitment exercise for a female squad to go in. And I luckily, um, the gentleman said to me, okay, let's see how medically fit you are. And he gave me the papers and said that I needed to go to the hospital to do the medical and all of those other stuff. And then we had to do the final interview. And then that's where my career in policing started. A few weeks after that, I was accepted into the police college and we were told to be there for 7 a.m. that Monday morning on the 16th of May, 1983. Another wrong turn. My parents paid for a, a, a hacker to take me to the police college and that hacker never showed up. And so I'm frustrated in my yellow dress, red shoes, trying to figure what I'm going to do. But we were a family of faith. We were a family of faith. And I was very active in Our Lady's Church. And so I walked to the rectory and in my disgust and frustration, explained my situation to Father John Johnson. And I said, Father Jay, I have to get there. I said, I should have already been there. He said, don't worry, Mello, just don't worry, don't worry. And so he put me in the car we had to drive back to Sunlight Village to get my luggage because you had to go with all your clothes. And we arrived at Lee's College minutes after nine, two hours late. And so when I got there, I met one Paul Allison Roll, who is now the commissioner of police standing on the outside. And he was like, what happened? I said, we can't go in because we are late. And so the instructor said to us, we're gonna be late for our own funeral. But I am the first to say that. At first I figured that maybe this wasn't gonna work, that this was, wasn't gonna work because I really wanted to be a mechanic and maybe I should just 
find my way and go back home, but there was thing in my head telling me stay. And so I stayed and 38 years later, I ascended to the rank of deputy commissioner. Through the journey, there's been many challenges because at the police college, you had to learn to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning. You had to do PE parade and the instructor would run you from the police college to, Mar to Montague Beach or Goodman's Bay. And I remember one day us coming back, we walking, um, they left us. They left us and we got back to the college very late. Of course, we got punished for, for being late. And then you had to do your fatigue, clean, clean your dorms, because you had to be a part of the muster parade and then fall in for the, for the, for the parade for in the morning for inspections. And it was an adjustment trying to learn how to clean buttons and clean shoes and learning rules and regulations and abiding by so much protocols. And I remember the first time my pass got stopped for two weeks and I couldn't go home. So for two weeks, you could imagine two weeks lockdown in the police college. And so we experienced our lockdowns. And then the day came for graduation. And that was the best day, I guess, of my life to be able to walk out of there. And then we were posted, we went for postings. My first posting was at Grove Police Station. Two weeks in the job, I got my first cut up. Remember, so City Market used to be at the Independence Roundabout there. A little parking boy was robbed and I was on foot patrol. And he hollered and I went into, to, into his defense to assist. And I ran after the guy. British American was not, where, um, was not there at the time in, in, 80, in 83. It was all bush. And I went behind this fellow. And we started fighting, started struggling. And he did whip my behind good. But if I never let him go. I never let him go. I held on to him until backup came. And so we arrested him eventually. And he went before the court and he was convicted. My time at Grove Police Station was very, very short. Very, very short. I spent about six months there. And then I went to traffic for three months. And we were uh, in the mornings, we went to traffic for seven in the morning and you had to do point duty at East and Bay and Parliament and Shirley. East and Bay and Parliament and Shirley are the worst points. Very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter because you got all of the breeze, all of the breeze from the sea came and you were cold, but you couldn't leave your point. But I think I credit my ride and my, my walk to BTVI as the start of my journey to adulthood. That paved the way to make it into who I am today. And so I am grateful for the lecturers at BTVI for the work that they would have done in instilling in me um, the principles and morals, the understanding of hard work and how hard work does pay off. After I left the traffic, I was transferred to police headquarters for nine years. I started the police credit union um, as the first staff to organize the police credit union. And so I would have done my training at teachers credit union and public workers to learn how to set up the police credit union. And today the police credit union is a multi-million dollar operation, but it started with one, with two police officers, myself and Clarence Russell, who's the director of immigration. He was responsible for the Freeport aspect of it and I was responsible for Nassau and so again I got my first promotion with four years in service I don't think then I understood what a promotion was the level of maturity the responsibility of leading people and all of that I didn't understand that then and I think it wasn't until I got sergeant six years later that I understood what leadership and what it is to be responsible for people. And I went to Carmichael Station for another seven years. Did seven years, they started the community policing program. But I think my niche started at Foxhill Police Station. When I went to Foxhill Station, we just had a series of serious crime incidents. Six persons were shot and I was transferred to Foxhill Station. And I was trying to figure why they sent me there. 
Why, why, why they sent me there? And an old lady said to me, when life hand you lemon, you make lemonade. When I got to the station, I was shocked that people actually worked in that kind of environment. The station was like something out of, uh, I can't even describe it because it was just a little small, little building, a small old fashioned building with dilly trees in the back of the yard. It looked like uh, one of those remote family islands. And I went there and started the community work there. And then we started working and with a strategic partner was able to do some extensive renovations to the station and to build it to what it is today. And so I'm grateful for, 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 for all of the people that poured into my life. I met so many people who assisted me along the journey, who continue to encourage me, who continue to encourage and say that, hey, look, you could do this. And then from Fox Hill Station, I went to the um, took over Elizabeth Estates. I was there briefly for two years, and then I was transferred to Eleuthero. And I didn't understand why I was going to Eleuthero because I didn't know anybody in Eleuthero. That was the first time I was separated from my son in my life. And I remember going there in August, and December came, and I couldn't come home for Christmas. And my son put me on blast on Facebook, talking about the Christmas dinner and I had to call Glenn Miller and ask him if he could please take uh, uh, please take up a plate of food for my son because I couldn't come home because all of my family had gone to, to, to the States to visit other family members and my son Rashad was home alone and I'm grateful for, for, for people like Glenn Miller and Douglas Hanna who continue to call and say look here man everything's going to be okay just remain focused I did two years and four months in Elizabeth and then was ready to come home. And the commissioner said, no, you have to go to Grand Bahama. I said, Grand Bahama? I, 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 I want to come home, time to come home. I didn't do my time. You told me six months, six months, so not to two years, four months. He said, you are transferred and that's it. And so sometimes, you know, for those younger persons on the platform in life, you get some directives and it may be uncertain for you. And sometimes it's not good to question it, but it's good to follow, to follow the directions because some people see beyond what we can see. And I went to Grand Bahama and I came home two years later to get married. And I married the love of my life. I had met him in 1995. And we finally decided to get married and I got married. And so in 2016, I came home and I've been home ever since. 2017, I was promoted to assistant commissioner with responsibility for family islands. But in all of those happy moments, there were challenges. Because in 2017, I had two major surgeries on my knee and I was out of office for a very long time. But it was because of my family support, my husband and my son, my sisters, and some very good dear friends who navigated me through the process, who helped to assist in providing support, ensuring that I go for therapy, that I get my meds, that I get the food that I needed while I was at home, that I was able to return back to duty. I returned back to duty in 2018 only to have to go back on another surgery again. And so in 2018, I worked. And then 2019, there was another surgery again. And so it was just from one challenge to the other. But I found that faith in God is just so important. Faith in God is so important. And then Hurricane Dorian came. And Commissioner Ferguson told me on the 2nd of September, right after the hurricane had passed, he said, you need to go to Abaco. And so I went to Abaco. I think one of the things Abaco taught me was that the importance and value of life. Because when we got there, there was nothing, no place for the police officers to live. 
we lived in a warehouse. Male, female, defense force officers, custom officers, immigration officers, all of the law enforcement officers were in a warehouse. And we had to sleep on the floor. And I remember reaching there on the 3rd of September and the officer giving me six bottles of water. And he said, that's for you to brush your teeth. And he gave me two gallons, two one gallons water. And he said, that's for you to bathe. I said, what? And that's what we use to bathe. And they give you a little tub. And so you wash and you do the quick, 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 quick. And then you had to hit the road. And we worked 24 hours a day because there was a lot of looting going on. A lot of people were still lost. People were concerned as to where their family members were, um, what was happening. Um, there was no telephone service. And so for the first nine days, I had no communication with my family, no communication with my family. I remember the day that I left to go to Abaco, my husband gave me two slices of peanut butter, a bread, two slices of bread with peanut butter on it. He gave me an apple and a snicker bar. I lived on the snicker bar, the apple and the peanut butter sandwich for four days. For four days, I took a little piece every day. And that's what, you know, but when you saw the desert, the, the, the destruction in Abaco, you didn't have time to focus on your hunger and your pain. I remember the first night falling, going on the ground to sleep. And the next morning I couldn't get up because both of my knees are, were impacted. And I remember calling one of the officers and saying, could you please come and help me to get up off the floor? And so it was a challenge. It was a journey. And we worked Abaco and tried to, to, to stabilize Abaco to the point where people, where flights started to come in and people was able to return home and try to look for their loved ones. And so I did Abaco for the better part of a year. And then right out of that, the pandemic came. I got, got promoted on the 3rd of March and the pandemic came a few days after. We had never had a pandemic. We'd never had a category five storm. And so as an organization, we had to determine what was the way forward. And so Commissioner Rule wrote down some policies, some operating um, procedures as to how we would operate. And he allowed me to do the administrative side of it. And so you had to manage lockdowns and, 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 and checkpoints. And we started off with 10 checkpoints and then the checkpoints increased to 75. And you had to find officers to work these checkpoints. And when the officers didn't come to work, you had to make sure that you had backup. You had to find food for them. You had to find water for them. You know, it turned out to be a very expensive venture. And then to deal with members of the public who had concerns, you had people who were sick and needed to get medication. They needed to go see their, their relatives who were sick. I remember meeting a, a, a young lady who said that her mom was sick and her mom needed care. And she'd asked for permission for, the, for another sister to go and stay. And we had to give her a letter so that she'd be able to go beyond the, the curfew hours and, and, and the lockdown to get there. And so I think if you're not humble, if, you're not, if you don't have a heart and a care for people, I don't think that you'll make it. You have to be concerned about what is gonna happen and put yourself in that position. Because many times people were told no on the 311 numbers and they sent the email. We had to reverse those decisions and say yes, because you had to look realistically at what it is the person is asking for, what it is that they're asking for. You know, I know we had a lady who traveled from Ilustra to Grand Bahama to bury her, her, I think her aunt, and then they got locked down in Freeport and she got stuck there. And they had, they, they had only taken sufficient clothes and enough money to last for that weekend. And they had no place to stay. And so we had to make a decision as to how we will assist them in getting them in. Fortunately, during the process, 
there were a number of flights that were going in for emergency purposes. And so we asked one of the pilots, are you able to assist and put two persons on your plane and bring them in once they had the permission? You know, and so we got a lot of help through the process, a lot of help. But you know, I think I, I, I think for me, the, the important part of it is that it taught me what, what it is to be a human being, what it is to be a human being. Through the challenges, I learned to be triumph. Policing by its nature, as a woman, you're in a male dominated organization. But never one day did I feel challenged or feel frightened to be counterpart with my male, with, with my, with, with my male colleagues. Because once you are a worker and they can, they have your support, you get their support. 100%. And so I enjoyed going on the road with the fellas um, in the night, in the day, and patrolling. I remember one time we were driving, dri driving, and, and, and there was an accident. And policing, you have to respond to so much things. But I think it's because of my journey at BTVI, my start at BTVI, and, and, and that ended me where I, I am today. At least see how much more time I have. Listen, at this point, I'm gonna encourage persons, listen, if you have questions, as I'm sure, I'm sure that you do, uh, please, please drop the questions in the chat. There was something you said though, and I wanted you to make a connection for me. You have certainly pioneered a whole lot of stuff. Being the first female at that rank, um, you started, you said the, the union, the credit union. Also there was that community policing program. What role did BTVI play in this? How did BTVI help to prepare you for this? I think um, I remember in one of the classes, Mr. Blyden, when he was teaching us how to set up the table, when he was teaching us how to set up the, the, the dinner table with the fork and, and the knife and the spoon and the napkin and the, the wine glass and the different glasses and all of that, he made a, 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 a quote, a remark that stayed with me through life. And he said, one cannot connect without the other. He said, you can't have a proper dinner without the fork, the knife, and the spoon. And so the journey couldn't start without the connection at BTVI. Without the connection at BTVI. I went there to do the mechanic course, but I ended up doing the, 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 the hotel training. And it was a beautiful course. The blind was a respectable gentleman, elderly, and we learned a lot. We learned life skills from him. Back in the day, you used to get a little stipend from BTVI. And he used to tell you, um, I think it was, what, about 60? Either 60 or $90. And the first thing he said when we got the first check, he said, put aside $30. He said, put aside $30. And so I learned savings by going to BTVI. I learned savings, how to save, how to start, because he said, Put aside thirty dollars. He said, "If you don't have to spend the whole sixty, put the rest up." I have another question. Female, female, female. You're female. You said that you went and you wanted to do auto mechanics, and then you went into the hotel um, industry, and then you ended up on the Royal Bahamas Police Force. And you as yourself admitted that it's predominantly male, and we tend to look at it as a male profession. What do you say to the female students at BTVI who have elected to take these trade areas or to pursue these trade areas when everyone is telling them, listen, girl, try hard, wear them pearls and try hard, pull your face up with makeup and wear them heels and go in one job to sit behind a desk. What do you say to them? I would say, like I said to my son, when my son wanted to be to do music, um, I, at first I said, music can't pay the bills. I said to him, music can't pay the bills. And I remember Donella Bodie saying to me, she said, 
it will pay the bills. She said, it can pay the bills. She said, not all, all of our children are designed to be doctors and lawyers and engineers and all of that. She said, and so we need some musicians. She said, she said, as you get older, you're gonna be happy that he could sing and he's gonna sing melodious music and throughout the house for you. She said, because when you start to get lonely and he start to sing, and I can tell you that has been my greatest passion, him singing throughout the house um, and, and making music and making me happy. But I believe that whatever your dream is, whatever your passion is, you can achieve it. As parents, sometimes we want to tell our children what, what we want them to be, right? But if they want to be a plumber, we should encourage them to be the best plumber, to be the best plumber. Because at the end of the day, they're gonna put food on the table. Can we imagine a Bahamas without plumbers? Okay, during the pandemic, there were so many houses that flooded. So many people had flooding issues, toilet backing up and all of that. And, if they, and they had to call and ask for their plumbers to come to the house to, 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 to repair their problems. So can you imagine if we didn't have plumbers? And the answer to that is no, I can't imagine what would happen if we didn't have plumbers. I see the chairman made a comment uh, in here. Your, yours is an excellent story that tells, you know, of how we can overcome adversity and all of the challenges. You know, he said an inspiration for persons to face the unknown and to overcome challenges. Speaking of challenges, we know that we had to make a pivot to um, online learning yes. during the pandemic and we remain right there for the most part. What advice do you give to the BTVI students who have now had to make this change? Because we know a lot of them like to sit in the classroom, um, but what do you say to them as it relates to overcoming their challenges based on your experience? Miss America for 2016, a young black female, she said that she was working, I, I think she was a part of the army and on her summer break, she worked at Target. And she said, while she's working in Target, putting up the clothes, she saw this white lady staring at her. And the lady came up to her and asked her, um, are you, ask her how old she was. And she told her how old she was. And then she asked if she was married. And she asked if she was born in the country. And she said, yes, she was born in the country. And then the lady told her how beautiful she was as a black person. But before that, she was getting annoyed with the woman because she was asking her so much questions. And the woman said to her how beautiful she was and she believed that she could win a pageant. And the woman invited her to meet her at Starbucks the following day. She went to Starbucks and had these stacks of books and was showing her about pageants and all of that. The long and short of the story is, is that she tried six times and every year she tried, she lost. Every year she tried, she lost. And so you will fail sometimes, but failure is not the option. Failure is not the option. She said she tried six times and on the sixth occasion, I think, she was able to, to successfully win Miss Columbia, I think the place where she came from. And eventually um, she won Miss USA. But her word, her name is Dashina Barber. And she said a powerful, a powerful line. She said, do not fear failure, but be terrified of threats. She said, giving up is the birth of regret. She said, doors will shut for you and people you know, we will, we will fail, but failure is not an option. She said, the reality of life is that you will hear more no's than yeses. Don't take no for an answer. Be afraid of the possibility of the yes that you have prematurely destroyed because you decided to quit before the clock strikes 12. Powerful words. I was taken aback amazed by what she said, you know, and, and she talked about her story. And not only that, 
she was a survivor of sexual child abuse. And she lost her mother through cancer. Okay? And she had a powerful story. And so when you have some time, pull it up on YouTube. A beautiful black woman, but she had a very powerful story and a powerful message to tell. That's powerful. You know, I am, oh, I'm sorry. I am from Haitian descent. My mother is Haitian. And I know going through school, in primary school, I remember this boy, Dion Johnson. He used to pull my ribbon and my elastic off my hair every day. And he's bully me. And then I ended up at Donald Davis with him, a biggity boy. And then I went to Aaron Bailey with him, you know? And then surprisingly, I joined the force and he joined the defense force. And I saw him some years later. And I said, Dion, you remember used to pull my hair, you know? And even in policing, I know some of my colleagues, they said, oh, Haitians are not gonna make it. You're born in a country and you're not accepted. You, 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 you're, not, you're not accepted, you know? The first couple development course I went on, I was the only female with, with a group of males. I came first in that course. And three of the males challenged, they wanted the instructor check my paper against their paper because they don't believe that I should have come first. They don't believe that I should come first. And that's interesting that you would have said that because another question in the chat was, as a female in a male dominated field, how did your male counterparts react to your upward mobility on the force? I think you have to start off by respecting yourself first. You have to respect yourself and you have to believe in you. You have to believe in you because you are your greatest supporter, but you are your also greatest destructor. And so I believed in me. I had a family that supported me 110%. My sisters were my greatest supporters. And so I didn't need friends because my sisters were always there for me. All of my sisters had moved on to higher learning. I have a sister who was a police officer, a teacher, a nurse, and she works now at Ministry of Education. I have one sister who is a health risk manager in the United States. I have a sister who's a chartered accountant, one who's a banker, and I have another sister at Central Bank. They are my greatest supporters. Anything that I wanted to do, they were the ones who I called first and I said, this is what I would like to do. And they were always in my corner. To this day, they are still there. They are still there. Okay. So what I'm getting from you is that you are encouraging, you are encouraging uh, the BTVI um, students and grads to have that very strong family support as well. Yes. Okay, so the question was asked about how the males responded to you. Another question came in, well, how did the females respond to your upward mobility? Well, um, when I went to, when I went to Carmichael Station, because I had gotten my two promotions in police headquarters, I went there as a, as a rookie, even though I went there as a sergeant. And there was only one person at that station I knew, and that was Jerry Josie. And so I leaned on him. I became his best friend and he would help me. I remember the first criminal file that I had to write on. I didn't know what to write on a file. So I said to Josie, let's go on patrol. And he went on patrol with me. And while we were on patrol in the Coral Harbor area, I say, Jerry, I got this file. Let's read this, help me with this. And we read it and he helped me and he said, no, Sarge, you have to write this, you have to write that. And I wrote in everything to that. And I remember writing to the officer, a male officer and telling him what instructions that he needed to do and to return the file. And he came to me and he said, when I joined the force, you was on history dragging your feet. I said, you carry out my instructions. You have to be firm. You have to be firm. You have to be firm. You don't have to be rude, but in the same breath, you could be firm. You, you could be firm and you could be resolute and they will understand. Before I left the force, I was responsible for discipline. And so they knew that I was a hatchet. They knew that I was a hatchet. I served as the president of the tribunal. 
And so I, I, I dealt, I, I oversee on discipline matters. The very first matter I dealt with, I had to fill a four days, a four days pay. I remember Mr. Green said, say, you ain't gave him a warning? I said, warning? See, no. I said, because people hold police officers to a standard that is higher than themselves. I said, when you come to this office, you have to know what it is that you want to do. I said, you cannot misbehave that way. And then we give you a pat on the back. It shouldn't happen. I see two comments in the chat. One says, awesome presentation. And this is Delancey's story is encouraging. I see the other comment from Dr. McPhee, and it had to be a doctor, right? Dr. McPhee yeah. said, what a story. I will await the, bi the biography slash book. So certainly you have a story. You really have a story within a story. Um, I see any Donna other Carter is raising a hand. Okay, Ms. Cartwright, can you enter something into the chat, please? Are you able to? Okay, so she's going to put something into the chat. Okay. Can you give some advice to the BTVI student, the alum? How important is discipline to your success? Now, I know that you and I had a meeting that was planned last week. And due to another meeting that ran over time, I had to send you a note to say, you know what, unfortunately I've been detained in this meeting, but I'm going to let you know as soon as I am available. But when you and I spoke the following day, you said to me, you know, I waited for you. I waited the entire hour for you. And that said, and I said to myself, what discipline? You know, that said to me that you made up in your mind that you'd given me that hour. And you were going to allow me to have that hour, whether I was available or not. So I would like for you, please, to tell the alum here, everyone here in the room, what role does discipline play in your success overall? Discipline and honesty goes hand in hand. Discipline and honesty goes hand in hand. Um, in policing, um, there's a lot about policing that, that, that the average person doesn't know. Um, but policing teaches, teaches you discipline because you have to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning. If you get up late, you have to carry your mattress. And I, that happened to me. I fell asleep and overslept. And when I woke up, the, lec the, 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 the instructor said, go and get your mattress. And so you had to run around the compound with the mattress on your head. And the others, the other students will be laughing at you. You ain't gonna do that again. You ain't gonna do that again. Okay. And a part of the, the, the process, they teach you your time, time management, which is very, very important. And so you got up at four to be outside for 4 30 for PE parade. You got back at six. Between six and seven o'clock, you had to clean your room. You had to clean your room. All the shoes had to be on, under the bed. They had to be brushed. All of your clothes had to be folded. You couldn't get up and leave the bed un, unmade and all of that. And at seven o'clock, the instructors will come and they do inspection, okay? And so one half will clean, everybody clean their room. And then one half will have the hallways and the windows to clean. And the next half will have the bathroom because you had bathroom duty. They didn't have a maid. And so you had to do, you had to do, a, um, talk about that. And then after you finished with that, you got ready and you went for breakfast. You had 15 minutes to have breakfast because by a quarter to eight, you have to be on the parade grounds for Master Parade. Master Parade included inspection. That's inspection of your nails. You had to present your hands for inspection. Your nails had to be a certain end. Back in 80s, Three, you weren't allowed to wear polish. You weren't allowed to wear polish and, and all of that in the long nails and all the colors that they have today. You couldn't do that. And so you had to fall in for parade and they check your shoes. They check even in the grooves of your shoes. So you had to take the polish and put it in the grooves of the shoes. The buttons had to be clean. You couldn't leave the silver in the grooves of the button. Okay, when that was finished, you then had five minutes for bathroom to freshen up yourself and then you go into class. 
and class was from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Okay, you had your little 15 minutes break and then you had your half an hour for lunch. I have then a question. 30... Sorry, oh, I'm go sorry. Ahead. sorry, sorry, this is a burning question. Listen, you made it to the top of your career. Um, and the question is being asked, how important is training and retraining? Because we know ain't too many people want to be the, the constable and the corporal and the sergeant. We just won't wear khaki and we want all them little, uh, I don't know what you call them, the little flowery things around the hat, you know? So <laughs> please tell us, tell everyone present, especially our alum and of course those who are currently students, how important it is to train, to retrain, and of course, to learn the fundamentals and work your way up. When you join the force, you join the force as a recruit. And when you pass out, you pass out as a constable. But you are in a two-year probation. So you go through your probationary training. They have something that is called to the constables. And so you are assigned to a senior constable who would help you in statement writing and all of that. I remember at Grove Police Station, I went to do a sudden death. And a sudden death is when somebody dies at home. The police have to go there. You have to check the body, turn the body over to make sure that there's no bruises or nobody killed them and all of that. And once you are finished with that, then you have to take a statement from the next of kin. I went in Bay Point to do this, this sudden death. And the woman was so... She was so overwhelmed, she was crying a lot. And so I said, well, anyhow, I'll come back to work earlier the next day so that I could take the statement. Um, my sergeant who was Desiree Schroeder, when she got to work seven o'clock that morning, her job was to pull all the files overnight and read them. And in my file, there was no statement. So she sent the patrol car to my house from Grove Police Station on East Street to get me. So I told the officer, I said, okay, I come in. I made the mistake by going to the station in a jeans and a shirt. And when I got there, she asked me if I stupid. She said, go back home and put your uniform on and then you come back to me, right? And I went there and she said, go to the house now and take that statement. She said, you go there. She said, you're not supposed to leave or leave that house without having that statement taken. And so I went and I took the statement and then I went home after I was finished with the file. The very first statement that I took, she tear it up in my face. The very first statement that I took, I went back to the station and she looked at it and she said, this is garbage. And she tear it up. She said, go back and take it over again. She said, it has to have this, it has to have that. And she told me what the ingredients that it needed, okay, to constitute for a complete statement. After 18 months of being a, a, a police officer, you are eligible to take an exam that is called the proficiency examination, okay? That is your first step to elevation. Back then, it was only three exams that you had to take. It was law, and it was traffic, and it was general police duties. And so you had 10 questions, you had two hours to do the exam, and you had the 10 questions. Part of the questions was essay. Part of the questions were content. They give you sections in the law that you have to refer to and you have to create that, okay? If you are lucky enough to be promoted to the rank of corporal, you then go on a corporal development course, okay? You go back into the police college where you do four weeks of training, four weeks of training, okay? And then after that, you are eligible to take the sergeant's exam, okay, from corporal to sergeant, which is much harder. But today now the exam is five, five modules. So you have law, you have general police duties, you have traffic, they have um, administration, and then I think it's an intelligence, score, an intelligence test that you have to do. After you finish the rank of sergeant, there is no more exams but you have to do courses. And so you have the sergeant, sergeant development, you have the sergeant management, you have an, um, other local courses like customer service, um, how to, 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 to case file management and all of that. Um, 
and, and do. And then you have international courses that you may be selected to go on. I was selected to go to Ross to El Salvador for six weeks. Six weeks, we lived in El Salvador in a hotel for six weeks. The experience in El Salvador was breathtaking um, because that was the first time I saw armed police officers in the front of a convenience store. Every store that you went to in El Salvador, they had armed police officers. The year that we went to El Salvador in 2007, they had 892 murders. When we left the, 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 the hotel in the morning, we left under heavy police escort and we returned under heavy police escort. We couldn't go out of the hotel unless we had escort. And then when I was finished with that, I went to, um, to Roswell, Mexico for four weeks of training, four weeks of training and extensive management training. And so training is very important. Um, at the police college, we've been doing a number of courses over the um, during the pandemic. Um, we also had Zoom classes. Um, and so we use whatever platform is necessary to, to get the message. And right now they are doing training with the elections and what the role of the police officers should be, what, what, what they should know about the law and all of that. Okay, wonderful. So that, that really answered the question because you just told us how training is continuous on the police force. You spoke about how it contributed to your success. And so the message then to the alum and to the current students, and of course, indeed, everyone on the platform is that you must continuously learn, make yourself a lifelong learner. I can hear Dr. Pachette Maxi saying that right now, lifelong learning, lifelong. And not only, not only the, 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 the courses on the college, you have to take responsibility for your own professional development. You have to take, take responsibility for your own professional development because sometimes the organization can only take you so far. Agreed. But if, if, if you want to reach to a plateau or you want to get to another level, sometimes you have to invest in yourself. You have to invest in yourself. You know, um, to spend, to spend $2,000 to do a course, you may think um, that this is a lot of money but think about the benefits that you will have on the back end. Think about the benefits that you'll have on the back end, you know. All right, so before time gets away from us because we are really, really just about out of time, I will just ask one final question. I give you an opportunity for a humble brag, a humble brag. What would you say is your greatest accomplishment to date? And you can choose whether it's a, an accomplishment on the job, so career-wise uh, or otherwise. What would you say is your greatest accomplishment? I think my greatest accomplishment is to see smiles on people's faces, to see smiles on people's faces. Um, when I worked as a community officer, um, many children went missing. Many children went astray. Um, at S.C. McPherson, when I was at Carmichael Station, you know how many children I took off the bus? And I remember going into Royal Bank one day and a young girl said to me, Sergeant Davis. And I was like, Sergeant Davis, you think, you know? And she said, you don't know me? She said, but thank you for taking me off the bus that day when I was going to skip school. She said, I listened to you. She said, I listened to you. And today I am working in the bank. I'm pursuing my degree. And that, I think for me, that's a, the, 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 a brag that I could talk about, you know, that I could talk about. There are so many young people, lives who I've impacted, who, who I've impacted, who I've seen um, develop and matured um, to be responsible citizens in this country. Um, so many young police officers who look up to you, look up to me and who are gracious for the time that they spent with me. You know, when I was a sergeant, I remember I put a hundred dollars in the cabinet. Um, and when the officers came to work, one officer came to work one day and I asked him, I said, you and the barber mad? And he said, Sarge, I have no money. And I remember giving him $20 out of that money. I said, go to the barber and cut your hair. Payday, bring the $20 back. And that $100 turned over every month. It turned over because that bought lunch for children that bought um, medicine, all kinds of things. 
And then we met two little children. Um, their mother died, but they were living with an aunt. And the aunt was a, a sister at the hospital, but she had to be to work for 6.30 in the morning. And she used to drop those children to Carmichael Primary School in the morning before she go to work. And so we encourage her, don't take them there, bring them to the station. And sometimes she brought them wrapped in the blanket and we got them ready for school. We fed them breakfast. We collected home, uh, we collected homework, we collected report cards. We kept children. We had the summer program, which was supposed to be nine to one. But the summer program sometimes end up at 7 p.m. because that's when the parents could come and pick them up. You know? And so I am, I I I I just have so much stories. All right. Well, guess what? You can't tell all of them tonight. So we're going to need you, like Dr. Plachette Marquis said, to write that book. We're all going to be waiting for that book. So thank you so much. And without further ado, Kadrin, I'm going to invite Kadrin Carey, who is a 2021 alum. Good evening. I am elated once again to be here and excited. Um, wow. I, I was listening so attentively. I mean, uh, wow, that was an awesome presentation. You are truly an inspiration. Miss Davis Delancey, um, in the words of uh, Miss, sorry, in the words of Miss Ram, Ram Dams, um, she's a recognized author and a, a, a global fundraiser for women. We need women who are so strong that they can be gentle, so educated that they can be humble, so fierce that they can be compassionate, so passionate that they can be rational, so disciplined that they can be free. And you, Ms. Davis Delancey, you are such a woman. On behalf of all of us who attended this evening, I thank you for taking time to share with us the highlights of your journey. Your experience is an excellent example of how we all can make the best of every situation and even find ourselves on the wrong proverbial bus, but in the right way. I encourage you to remain BTBI strong. Okay, so. We are here and here are your alumni updates. The distinguished alumni nominations are in and the date has been set for the second alumni distinguished ceremony. BTVI will host a virtual distinguished alumni ceremony and that will be under the theme of runway to 5K. We will ask you to mark your calendars and we're asking you to keep an eye on the BTVI Facebook page so that we can give you any updates. The tickets are going to be $50 per person and they can be purchased from the Fund Development Department. Calls can be made at 502-6321 or 3 and you can get your tickets. We also still have the raffle going on, everyone. I mean, the summer is hot. I don't know about y'all, but I already get my tickets. So here are the raffles. So the hot summer raffle is still going on. You can spend $5. So instead of getting a $5 full up from that place, they didn't sponsor us, so I won't say who they are. You can get the chance to win an air fryer or a five, uh, fire stick. Or you could spend $10, that's the tickets I got, and I got my chance to win a ductless air condition or the $50, well, maybe maybe I'll do the 50-inch TV because, you know, you like the Netflix and chill. Okay, so to do that, we're going to call Miss Laurie Tucker, and she is at 502-6321 or 3 to purchase the tickets. The drawings are going to be September 10th, so you still have time. Coming up for the BTVI alumni branded items, everybody knows that you got to be BTVI strong, whether you went there when it was called something else, or now we're still calling it BTVI. Once you went there, you are a BTVI alumni. So we're going to have the, the branded landings, the hot and cold mugs, the bumper stickers, and of course the t-shirts. 
finally, alumni, do you need assistance with writing your resumes? If so, we are here to help. Please send your resumes to resume at btvi.edu.bs. Also, if you would like help with your resume being placed on the Department of Labor's portal or at the BTVI job placement pool, you can contact the Office of the Students Affairs. Their number is 502-6311. And those have been your alumni updates for the month. Please contact us at alumni.btvi.edu with any comments or recommendation. Once again, Ms. Davis Delancey, thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. It was very inspirational. It was very, very, I mean, impactful. And I love the fact that persons still recognize you today. I now call Ms. Thompson so she can do the wrap up for us. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Cadrian. And I too would like to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Davis Delancey. I'd like to say thank you to everyone else who has joined us this evening. Just as a reminder, the last Monday, the last Monday of each month, we have the speaker series and we would like to see you again next month. So have a wonderful evening. God bless you.